the line. We love coming out here and chatting with you. Uh, we want to welcome all everyone in person, of course, but also everyone watching on Zoom. That's always an option as well. Today, we're learning about something uh, not a lot of people know about. Uh, glacial Lake Yahara. We're going to go way back in time here and learn about the history of our beautiful lakes. Before we had Mendota, Mendota, Wingro, Obisa, and Gansa, we had one large lake that formed at the end of the glacial period. Now, in fact, the large lake has remained for a few thousand years, meaning that the descendants of the Ho Chunk people that first settled in this area uh, were also around with that one large lake in place. So today we'll learn about what the lake looked like and what it started to divide into different lakes. Again, just the history, right? And this is something that I would love to dive into as well. So I'm very excited for the talk today. Uh, we do have a short video to share to kick off today's program to talk a little bit about a brief history. And if you were at the uh, annual breakfast, it will be a very, very familiar video for me. We call this area only for thousands of years, but the view was created thousands of years before that. Let's travel back in time, way back before Wisconsin was a state, where the United States was a country, way before the Greek and Roman empires. And even before Ho Chunk arrived to the sacred part of the world, we're here in Greater Mass 15,000 years ago. But we're not standing on the ground, we're on top of all ice up to a mile thick. This is the Wisconsin glaciation, and it covered most of Canada, the upper Midwest, and New England, but it paused on the horizon. Over the next 2,000 years, we will witness the big glaciers start to melt and retreat. Where we once stood on ice and snow, large lakes stretching from the present day of Middleton, stout and around. Enter humans. 13,000 years ago, we would see the first human activity occurring on the shores of these waters, but the lakes hadn't divided yet, meaning distant ancestors of Hoja. Well, near a large single water body, later named Glacial Lake Yahara by geologists, but more change has come. In 10,000 years before present, we see water levels fall, separating into four current lakes and even shallow water pushes, including one that would later be turned into Lake Oinkara. Along the area, the ocean called the Joe, which translates to four lakes. Early surveyors document a whole chunk producing over 3,000 bushels of corn annually. Now, Middleton, Madison, and at the center of danger, much like today, since Lake Midor, now known as Old Study Lake Midor. The lake was once called Akshay, translating to where the person rests. Bejo was a cultural epicenter for native mound building people, with evidence of over 1,200 effigy of burial mounds documented in the area, a concentration that rivals any other place in North America. The water is sacred too. The whole chunk, with its massive ancestral land base throughout present day Wisconsin and reaching areas of Canada in the Dakotas and into present day Indiana, know the water as a identity, a life, a meaning, and a purpose. Yeah. Right. Preserving the utmost care and protection. They rely on water for fishing, wild rice harvesting, and transportation, but also treat it with a spiritual reverence as a living entity that provides so much to the people of Dejo and beyond. That important relationship with water has lasted centuries and has kept the Ho Chunk Nation from its traditional clan beings to this modern day government as protectors as one of the most important life resources. 
This is why the Holy Shunk poured tobacco for the water spirits and returned the water attack to the people. It's been 13,000 years since humans first congregated here. The future holds promise, but perhaps the past can offer lessons to how we develop relationships with our lands and waters. As we move forward to make our lakes better, we must also look back and draw upon the lessons learned from the whole chunk. We knew the protection and reverence to the water would in turn lead to a thriving community. Okay, lights are back up, everyone back away. Uh, great video, great summary of what we're going to be hearing about today. Uh, if you are watching virtually, when well, we do get to the Q&A portion in about 40 minutes, you can go ahead and look at the bottom of the screen and you'll be able to uh, click on the comment section, ask your questions there, and uh, we'll have Adam uh, coordinate that a little bit later. Now, let's get to the show. Before we get to the exact talk, I want to introduce Kim Shaw from National Guardian Life Insurance Company. To give us a few more updates about Clean Lakes Alliance and to introduce today's speaker, Kim. Welcome to cards, everyone. Thank you, Max. Welcome, everybody. It's great to see everybody here today. Um, National Guardian is a proud sponsor of these monthly talks and a proud sponsor of Clean Lakes Alliance. Our building is located directly behind uh, the Edgewater. We've been in that location since about 1964. And we're so lucky to have the lake as part of our working environment. It's both energizing and peaceful when people can look out of our windows and uh, enjoy the natural beauty. Uh, we appreciate all of our sponsors, uh, the presenting sponsors, First Weber. I don't know if anyone's here from. First Weber, but uh, also the hosting sponsor, the Edgewater, and joining National Guardian is Alliant Energy as a supporting sponsor. So thank you. And shout out to the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies and the UW Extension, too. So thank you very much. Um, WKOW, thanks for uh, being a media sponsor. Uh, a little bit about National Guardian. Uh, we've been in business over a century selling life insurance and we help people deal with financial um, stresses and financial needs with dignity, confidence, and grace. Uh, so if you've never heard of us, check out our website. So quick update. There's a Q&A after the end of that person's uh, talk. Um, if you're a person, we'll take questions. If you're online, just submit your questions through the Q&A. We'll get to as many as possible. Um, if you haven't renewed your individual friend or business uh, uh, donation or have never donated to the Clean Lakes Alliance, uh, now is your chance. Um, James Ty, executive director, is back there and uh, his staff, so he can uh, direct you to uh, the donation site. But we appreciate anything. Keeping our lakes clean and safe for everyone is critical. Um, the money donated will support programs and projects uh, even yet this summer. Wow, Clean Lakes has been awarded 1.4 million in grants since 2010, thanks to donations from everybody like you. Again, that website, cleanlakesalliance.org. Okay, today's talk. Uh, here to present uh, the Glacial Lake Yahara is uh, Dr. Eric Carson. He's a geologist with the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey. And he's also a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for over a decade. Is that right? Wonderful you could be here today. I hope you had a great summer. Uh, Dr. Carson has had 20 years of experience uh, in research and teaching and extensive work on Wisconsin's last glaciation. Has anyone ever said that word, glaciation? <laughs> so I want to welcome Dr. Eric Carson and please come up.
Thank you all. I uh, appreciate the invitation. And uh, telling folks that I, I was getting introduced around, um, it's nice to see the end of the pandemic and getting back to giving talks like this in public and uh, being able to give a talk and see people's faces so I know I can use them rather than talking online and uh, have no clue not to use them. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm here to talk about uh, works and my colleagues and I have been doing in the Madison area. Uh, I, I have been hired uh, 15 years ago now by the Wisconsin Geological Survey uh, to work in the Driftless area, the southwest portion of the state. That, that's where uh, my natural research abilities are. Uh, but coming back this way, right to the margin of the last glaciers, is where a lot of my research has gone, and this is what we'll be talking about today. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that this, this is absolutely not me working by myself. So my colleagues, Casey Stolzman and Elmo Rollins of the Geological Survey have been involved in this. And Libby Ives, who was a graduate student at UW-Milwaukee, but she now works at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at Caltech, uh, have been instrumental to this work as well. So whenever I say I will be, I'm using it in a bigger uh, sense. So let's start here. Uh, the, the video was a nice introduction for us to think about these glaciers that have existed on the landscape in the past. So this is our view of Wisconsin, with how it started versus how it's going right now. Uh, on the left is a snapshot that we'll say was maybe uh, 20,000 years ago. That would have been at the peak of the last cycle of glaciations. And that's showing how much of the state was covered by these large ice sheets that were originating uh, up in Canada and flowing for us down to the south into the northern part of the United States. <clears throat> so I'll take a moment here and, and give a large picture overview of that, of these cycles of glaciations that we've had over the, over the past uh, uh, several million years in, uh, in, in North America and across the globe. Um, so if we look at, across the entirety of the Earth's history, if we look back at four and a half billion years worth of the Earth's history, one of the things that's really important is that we are in a unique time that the Earth actually does have glaciers on it. Most of the Earth's history, there haven't been any glaciers at all. Uh, there are several global preconditions that need to be met to have glaciers, have a climate that's conducive to large masses of ice growing on the landscape. Uh, also, you need to have... Uh, large land masses at the polar regions. Glaciers can't grow on oceans, they have to grow on land, and at times in the past, the continents have been huddled down near the uh, equatorial regions, and it doesn't matter if it's polar or not, there's no land in the polar regions for glaciers to grow on. So if we look back about uh, five to seven million years ago, a lot of these global preconditions were being met. We had large land masses in, in the Arctic region, we had Antarctica down right on the South Pole, we had continents distributed across the, the uh, globe, and we had uh, oceanic circulation systems that were allowing a good transfer of heat, all of these are those preconditions. And that brought the Earth into a uh, situation where small fluctuations in the Earth's orbit could control the growth and uh, decay of glaciers. There would be regular variations in the Earth's orbit, the shape of its orbit, uh, the way the Earth's axis is tilted, that depending on uh, the, the moment, those could be aligning to make climates slightly colder and make glaciers grow, or to make climates slightly warmer and make those glaciers shrink. And all of those variations in the Earth's orbit, they happen cyclically. They happen on a regular basis. Um, and so there is a regular sort of metronomic growth and decline of glaciers that have occurred over the past two and a half million years here in North America. And so a lot of times we talk about the ice ages, so we talk about the last ice age. And what we're talking about is the last of maybe a couple dozen times that these climate variables have aligned to make these glaciers grow across the polar regions of, of the Earth. And then a couple dozen, couple dozen times where they've worn, and we've been in a condition like we are today, which we would call an interglacial period, where we don't have the huge ice sheets, but we do, do still have glaciers you know, covering Antarctica, covering Greenland, smaller village glaciers uh, spotted across the landscape. So this would be what we see at the at the peak of the last cycle. Twenty thousand years ago, we've got a land, we've got an ice mass that's centered around uh, what today is Hudson Bay. Uh, the ice there would have been maybe as much as three miles thick on the landscape. 
and flowing like silly putty across the landscape in every direction away from Hudson Bay. And so it's flowing down to the south and to the southwest. Here we are. Uh, and you can see in the eastern part of what is Wisconsin, uh, we have the ice sort of separating into a couple different fingers or lobes that we call them in, in the glacial geology world. And so we had this lobe of ice called the Green Bay Lobe that, you know, I don't know where it got its name. That's ice flowing down the, the lowlands of the Green Bay area. And next to it is the Lake Michigan Lobe, again, a pretty self explanatory name to it. And as you see it, we're right here on the edge of, of the um, extent of that glacier at its peak. We're just behind the margin, just a couple miles right here. Uh, if you look off to the west from that ice margin, you see the driftless area of southwest Wisconsin. And so the driftless area is known uh, for over 150 years as being that portion of here in the upper Midwest that through all of these cycles of glaciation, it's not just the last one, but the one before it and the one before that and the one before that, through all of the cycles of glaciations, there was never ice that covered that part of the state. Covered it in different, on different sides at different times, uh, but never covered it. And so you see a different landscape there. What you see should be a little bit familiar to you all doing lakes and river people. You see a landscape that's formed by rivers cutting down into uh, bedrock. And so that is the sort of unique defining characteristic of the driftless area. And then as we look at the image on the right, the how it's going now in Wisconsin, what we see is you can still pretty easily pick out the driftless area. And then as you look off to the east and the south southeastern portion of the state, you see a much different landscape. You're not seeing a landscape that's dominated by bedrock being near the surface. You're seeing a landscape that's dominated by glacial sediment being at the surface. And so we think of the driftless area as being that region that's carved deeply into the bedrock by rivers. But the reality is that's going on here and across the, south, the southeastern part of the state as well. So if we strip away the glacial sediment, we can actually see that going on. So here we have an old map uh, from 1973 that's showing the depth of bedrock, how far below ground surface you have to go to get to the to the bedrock surface, and you can see in the driftless area off on the western part of this map through much of the area, it's pretty shallow to bedrock, which is what we'd expect. We can see the, the pattern of bedrock, and then you can see the lower Wisconsin River is in those bright reds, which is telling us it's carved very deeply down into the, in the bedrock. In lots of places in the Wisconsin River, you have to go down 150 or 200 feet below ground surface before you hit the bedrock surface, because there's that much standing gravel filling them. The valley. As we go off into the eastern portion of this image, you see a much more complicated kind of image. You see a lot of reds telling us that it's deep to get down to bedrock, but you can kind of sort of convince yourself that that still looks like river systems in there. And that's what it is. We're seeing, we're seeing uh, buried river systems that were carved down into the bedrock prior to the cycles of glaciations. We just don't see them now because the glaciers dumped uh, tens and hundreds of feet of sediment on top of the landscape and burying it. And that kind of comes into focus. If we look right in here, you can't really read it from where you're sitting, but right in the center of that uh, green oval is the word mass. That is where we are right now. We're right in the center of a deep bedrock valley. And so uh, the, the first takeaway from this is that it's not an accident that the four lakes of Madison are where they are. It's also not an accident that they line up in a nice linear fashion. Uh, it's because they're sitting in an old glacier, in an old river valley. We geologists, we call that the ancestral Yahara River. Uh, so that's also where Glacier Lake Yahara comes from. So what we see is that, you know, sort of the, the formation of these lakes, the formation of Glacial Lake Yahara, they're all tied to this low, low topography that exists here, this old river valley. Um, just like the Yahara River today, this river valley was basically a, an extension of the Rock River. So it flowed down to the, uh, down to the south uh, into what we would call today the Rock River. And you can also see if you move a little bit east from that oval, you can see that there's another river system a little bit farther to the east. Today, that's basically the uh, uh, Pashkanon Creek, and Lake Pashkanon is, is in that little bit. So this is the setting that we've got. So there's a reason that we've got our four lakes here in Madison. There's a reason that Lake Yahara existed in the exact same footprint of them. 
So let's take another view of this. So hopefully this is familiar to you, recognizable to you. Right in the top center of it, you can see the, the uh, Barabo Hills in the bright white. So this is a topography image of the of the state. And then down in the uh, southeast corner of this image, you can see the, the lakes of Madison. You can see Mendota and Monona and maybe even the top of Pagasa on there. And then cutting across the map, you can see the, the blue line. That blue line is the maximum extent of that last glaciation. So that's as far as the ice went. At the peak of glaciation, everything to the east of that would have been covered to the ice. Everything to the west of that would have been uh, exposed without ice on it. Um, a good chunk of my research has, over the years, has dived into uh, looking at the exact timing of this. You know, if we want to understand modern climate, we want to understand what past climate was like before humans were agents in the, in the global uh, climate system. And so we want to understand to the best we can how quickly glaciers advanced and retreated um, under pre human conditions. And what I have found with my research that I've done, my colleagues have done, is that this landscape here, particularly in this image, is just absolutely littered with small lakes that used to exist that don't exist now, but were in existence back during these, um, this last glacial period. So all of these spots on here that are on the main image and even the one up on the, the larger, the, the area map up in the top left, um, that's glacial like Wisconsin, the large map, the large lake covering the center part of the state. And then down on this image, all of these dots are places where there were lakes that existed back during and immediately after the peak of the last glaciation that my colleagues and I have been researched on. We've gone to, we've collected samples of the sediment, we've collected cores from them um, to help understand the, the timing of when these lakes were forming and draining, which tells us when these ice sheets were advancing and retreating. So one of the things you notice about that is that on the main map, Every single one of those lakes that we're looking at are off to the west of that ice margin. So they're out beyond the glacial uh, maximum position. And what I'm actually going to be talking about to you today is in the other direction, off to the east, some of these lakes that existed as the glacier was retreating and exposing this new landscape covered with glacial sediment and looking at the timing of when that was happening. So we'll start that by looking into the um, history of science rather than the science itself. So this is an image from a publication from, from our office, the Wisconsin Geological Survey. Uh, that was published in 2001. One of our geologists, Lee Clayton, who was here at the time, and he had done a lot of research and a lot of mapping uh, largely associated with the glacial deposits. So this is a, a paper where he was taking a first look at some of these lakes uh, in the area. And so you can see uh, the eastern portion of Dane County, and you can see in red the outline of the four lakes. And then you can see a couple of uh, other lakes outlined that no longer exist today. So moving from west to east, we have a little one there that's called Glacial Lake Milton. And then strung out along what we see as the footprint of the four lakes, we have this Glacial Lake Yapara. And then extending even farther off to the to the east, covering large portions of Jefferson and Dodge County, is a lake that was called Glacier Lake Scuppernong. And all of these existed close in time to one another. Um, uh, Glacier Lake Yahara and Glacier Lake Scuppernong were actually connected hydrologically. Uh, there were times shown here that they were, you know, you could think of them actually as one lake. There were times that they may have been separated, but they both drained down what today is the, the Rock River Valley. And so even though, even if they weren't connected, they were hydrologically very similar because they were controlled by the same um, cell that kept them built. So this was uh, Lee having done some work in actually in Waukesha County, farther, farther to the east and into, into Jefferson County. And he was mostly interested in this glacial lake Scuppernong. And I'll get back to that in a few slides at the end. Um, what you can see there is he was envisioning um, sort of an enormous lake with hundreds and maybe even thousands of little islands dotting, dotting it like a Spanish armada of little islands out in this lake. Um, and the work that we've done, especially Libby, who I mentioned at the beginning, I found maybe that wasn't the case. 
Um, and there's glacial reasons for that. This was a lake that ex existed on a, a big sprawling surface. You can see it's a much larger lake. You know, what I'll be talking about, Glacial Lake Yahara, we're still confined in that river valley, the Yahara River Valley. And so you can see that Glacial Lake Yahara was larger than the four lakes today, which means it was higher. It was high enough that the, the water today, the four lakes were just all connected into a single lake. But it was still really relatively tightly constrained by that by that valley. And, and we kind of intuitively know this. You get an idea of it, you know that. Lake Mendota is whatever it is, 120 feet deep down the down the bed of the lake. But if you go out on picnic point, you've got bedrock right at the surface there. So you know there's that kind of topography of the bedrock sort of intuitively, even if you've never thought about it. Okay, so let's take another view of the same area and put this in context of the retreat of this glacier across the landscape. And so here is that line that marks the maximum position of the glaciers maybe 20,000 years ago. So the, the, the landform that's on the landscape is a, we call it a moraine. It's a ridge of sediment that marks where the ice was at a stable position. And so the landform that we have that stretches across the landscape, we call it Johnstown Moraine here in this area. That is the, the maximum extent of ice. It's a ridge of sediment. Uh, you can find it uh, all the way up to the Devil's Lake area. So it, it's, it blocks the Devil's Lake board, if both the north and the south end, the Johnstown Moraine does. Then it cuts down across the Wisconsin River right near uh, Sauk City. And then it scoots down and it's just to the west of Middleton. It's actually, uh, it, it cuts across in Cross Plains. If any of you are familiar with Cross Plains, as you come into the east side of Cross Plains, there's a shopping mall called the Glacier Edge Mall. That is absolutely accurately named. <laughs> that was at the edge of the glacier. They literally had to scrape the Johnstown Moraine out of the way to put in the parking lot for that place. Uh, then the Johnstown Moraine uh, swings down and cuts across uh, Highway 151 right near um, Verona, just to the east of the new Verona High School. And then zips off across uh, northern Rock County, as you can see in this image. So that's the maximum position we were at 20,000 years ago. Sometime after that, the ice, ice started retreating as, as climate was warming. But that's not a monotonic retreat for glaciers as they as they start to melt away. Uh, they, they sort of melt away. I think they, they advance, but we're interested in the melting. They melt away in sort of fits and starts. Now they may retreat for a while and then pause on the landscape, or they may retreat for a while and then advance just a little tiny bit. But every time they pause or every time they advance a little bit, they'll actually deposit new moraines. Uh, and we call these recessional moraines. Um, so we have a couple of those. So here we have the Milton phase moraine that cuts across the landscape, as you see there. And then we also have the Lake Mills Moraines, a series of moraines that cut across the landscape. And most of these are really small. You wouldn't, you, we, we, we call them ridges of sediment, but a lot of them may only be a few meters high. So you really have to uh, know your stuff. Even I have to kind of train my eye to be like, yeah, that actually is the Mills Moraine. Otherwise, you'd zip right past them uh, without ever knowing that they were there. But this gives us a little context if you think back to Glacial Lake Yahara being. Um, in the footprint of the four lakes today, or for the, the four lakes today being in the footprint of places like the Park, I guess is a better way to put it. You can see that that's located in between the Milton Moraine and the Lake Mills Moraine. So we're talking about something that necessarily has to be after the uh, peak of the last glaciation, during the time when ice was retreating back and exposing this brand new landscape. So here we'll zoom in on this. And really, you can think of Glacial Lake Yahara as occupying most of the dark gray areas right around the Four Lakes today. It was not too much higher, really just a couple meters higher than, the, than Lake Mendota is today, but that's enough to cover big chunks of the landscape. Um, with our work, we actually weren't interested in what the total extent of the lake was. That's kind of a, an arbitrary distinction. and. Uh, in any case, it's, with, with the way this lake worked, it's a, a little bit of a tough thing to tease out. Um, what we were interested in is the timing of the lake. When it formed, 
which is basically when the ice retreated away from the landscape. And when it drained down, when the Rock River was uh, cut down and eroded down to the point that this lake drained down to the to the modern four lakes. And so to get at that, what we were looking at was the lowest areas close to the four lakes that are exposed by uh, exposed above lake level now that would have been underwater. Basically, what we're looking for are oh, forgot something. Okay, so there with the blue arrows, we can see the Johnstown Moraine. There with the orange arrows, we can see that um, Milton Moraine. So basically, what we're looking here in, in the area were the lowest areas close to the lakes that we could find. And the other way you could think about that would be all the marshes and swamps around around the Madison area around the Four Lakes. So there in the in the blue dashes are showing some of these areas. And the reason we're interested in these is because we want areas that would have been as deep as possible down to bedrock. So they would be have, so they would be containing sediment from as soon as the lake formed. But we're also looking at the last, we're looking for the last things that would have been exposed above, above lake level as the lake dropped. Because that will tell us the very end of, of when this lake existed and the very start of when the four lakes existed. So these are our areas. We went around looking at the nice high resolution LIDAR, uh, high resolution topography that we have, looking at the uh, road networks for the few places where there's roads that cross these swamps and marshes that we could uh, use to get our drilling equipment out on, and also looking at uh, property management to see places where we can get out of these marshes, get permission to get out of these marshes during the, the winter months. So going through all that, we found nine different locations uh, stretching from uh, the up up water up, upstream side of Lake Mendota all the way down to Lake Kiganza. You can see those. So up around Lake Mendota, we have uh, Pheasant Branch, Cherokee Mark on the north side of the lake. Uh, the dot down on the south side is University Bay, right near Picnic Point and the, and the um, UW Hospitals. And then several of these other sites stretching on down the, um, down the string of four lakes. And so what we were doing was going to these sites and collecting sediment cores, drilling down into the ground, collecting cores to collect the entire history of sediment uh, that was preserved from this lake that existed and hoping to use that to give us the age control, the dating control um, for when the lake formed and when the lake drained down to the modern level. So I'll show you just a few pictures of this. Uh, this is from one of our locations uh, down on the east side of Lake Giganza. So this was a place where we had um, a road that crosses one of these marshlands, so we were able to just pull over on the shoulder of the road. And so the left is the a uh, vehicle that carries our drilling rig on the right is the drill rig itself. So it's a little unit that's on self-propelled track tank, tank tracks. Uh, it can go out across the landscape here. We're just pulling it off onto the shoulder of the road. And what it does is it takes up a, a steel tube that's five feet long. And inside it, we can put about an inch and three quarter diameter plastic tube that slots right inside of it. And then we literally hydraulically hammer it down into the ground five feet, pull it out, pull out the plastic tube, and we've got five feet of sediment. And then we put a new tube in, go back down the same hole, and hammer it down to 10 feet and pull it back. And we keep doing that, and we keep getting these barrels of, of plastic filled with the, the sediment from these lakes. In a good setting, we can reliably go down. Uh, I try to use metric because I'm supposed to be a good scientist. Uh, but they, these guys drill in feet. It's five feet. So I'll, I'll say five feet rather than 152 centimeters because five feet works better. Um, we, can, we can reliably go down in a setting like this 50 or 60 feet. In the best setting, uh, I think the deepest we've gone in a, in, a, in a setting like this is 93 feet. Is our, is our peak. Uh, beyond that, we have to move to a different different drilling uh, technique that we won't get into today. Um, but the, the nice thing about this is it's it's quick. We can do a 50 foot core in maybe an hour and a half or two hours. Um, we can you do it on the shoulder of a road like we show here, or we can take it off 
uh, road we need to. And so one of, one of the things about this research is that in many of these places where there weren't roadways that we were able to get permission from uh, the Dane County Parks or the, some of the um, uh, other entities that own these lands, we had to do this in the wintertime. So this thing weighs a few tons. So what we needed was a good snow cover to protect the surface. We also needed a deep frost so this thing wouldn't sink down into the um, into the muck. So this photo was actually taken in, in I think it would have been January of 2022. We wanted to do this research a year earlier, but the 2020 and the 2021 winter was actually so wimpy that the marshes never froze deep enough for us to get our rigs out onto. Um, so here we are. This is this was down by Lake Egan, so that we're, we were going out. Here we are set up pouring. This is at uh, Pheasant Branch Conservancy, just over in over in Middleton. So each one of these places, we were collecting these pores going down into the into the earth. And this is the kind of thing we we found. We found lake sediment, but, sediment, but we also found this one distinctive layer that really tracks the end of the uh, end of the lake's existence. Uh, it's called a marl. It's it, it, it's sort of a swampy lake edge kind of sediment, and you can see shot into it. You can see down at the bottom. You can see a nice little snail shell. You can see there there's bivalve shells in there. There are also plenty of plants, terrestrial and aquatic plant uh, remains that we were finding in this, which were those were what we were really looking for because we were using those for radiocarbon dating uh, to date the formation and demise of the of this lake. So we'll zip back to that and we'll zoom in there on University Bay. There we are. So you can see just to the south, you can see all the blocky patterns of the roads and the and the uh, University Hospital System. You can see Picnic Point just up at, at, at the top of the image, and University Bay and Lake Mendota itself off on the east. This is literally right by the athletic fields that are there. This is where we're doing this coring. So there you can see us out. We just happened to be doing it on a winter day uh, when we did this. There's another photograph of that sediment that we were looking for that was capturing the transition of it from lake to a marsh with a little nice little snail shell preserved in there. And this is a, a representation of the pores of what we we're finding. And because we we're looking for a very specific setting every time, we were finding very similar sediments every single time. So the two of these are simply showing the two variations that we tended to see. And the only difference being what was at the bottom. Uh, on the right were, were some of the cores we got down to sand and gravel, which we interpreted to be the ground surface before the lake formed or as the lake was forming. And then in some of them, um, we got so we got as deep as we could go and we didn't get to that. So we we're still in lake sediment. And so th this one, because I try to be a good scientist, is in meters. So that you know the the the, the, the chart on the left, the you know stratigraphic column we call it on the left, we went down 15 meters, which is about 50 feet. And didn't get to, to lake bottom. But what we saw in the dark, um, dark gray at the top, in every single one, we found about two meters, 2.1 meters of um, marsh sediment, peat, basically. And then below that, uh, in the sort of pale yellow, that would be this marl that we found that was the transition from real lake to marsh. And what's being shown in there, the, the little horizontal stippled patterns are places where we found nice little horizons of plant material that we're able to date with radiocarbon. And then but down below that in a medium gray, that was real light sediment. That was silt and clay that had nice perfect little laminations in it. And then every once in a while, it also had layers of, of plant material that we could date. And so we were able to do uh, quite a bit rate of radiocarbon dating from this. And the two pictures we got were a picture of the start of the lakes and a picture of the end of the lakes. And so the, the, the oldest date we had from any of these cores was right around 18,200 years ago. So that would have been our best estimate for when Glacial Lake Yahara formed, when the ice pulled back uh, and exposed this landscape and filled it with water. And then right around 11,200 years ago is when down on the Rock River, enough erosion had happened that the lake drained down to its modern level. So from all of our cores from the nine different locations, uh, we found uh, animal macrofossils in both aquatic and terrestrial plant fossils, 
several dozens of them, quite a few of them that we dated. So 18,200 is the formation. And as alluded to in the, in the video, um, right around 11,200 years ago represents that, that fall down to the four lakes. And when we look at the archaeological record, we can actually track that. So, so further from the other folks at, at UW and the anthropology department um, have um, archaeological sites from the predecessors, the ancestors of the Ho Chunk, that are located on shores of Glacial Lake Yamara. And then they have younger sites that are located down along the shores of, of the four lakes as, as the lake drained down and exposed new shorelines. The people were moving down to to stay close to the lake edge, just like we do today. We all live right at the lake edge. Okay, so really quickly, I think I've got a few minutes left here, so I'll zoom back out and I'll take a look at this glacial lake Scuppernong because it's it, it's part of the same story. So if we take a big picture look at this retreat, this would put us right at the, the Milton phase, that first recessional moraine. So ice has already retreated back from the, um, from the maximum position, from the downtown moraine. And we would have had the start of this glacial lake Scuppernong down in the southeastern corner of the lake, uh, of the map. We also would have had that little glacial lake Milton that had formed. So it was water that was dammed up against the ice at this point. And again, if you're, if you're familiar with the local geography, familiar with the Geography of Milton, you might never really thought about it, but the airport out there is located on a big flat surface. And that big flat surface is the lake bed of Glacial Lake Milton. Um, so that there's a reason that it's flat, and the flat is the reason they put the airport there. As the ice pulled away from there, we had Glacial Lake Yahara form. You see that Glacial Lake Milton is no longer there. It actually drained through the moraine that was there and it created the Pheasant Branch Conservancy. It, it created that gorge through the Pheasant Branch Conservancy that we have today. So we had this glacial lake Yahara form in the, in the Four Lakes. At the same time, we started forming this glacial lake Scuppernong. And like I said, our, our ages from glacial lake Yahara are about 18,200 for the formation of it. Libby and Elmo working over in glacial lake Scuppernong. Uh, their best radiocarbon ages are about 17,900 for the initial formation of glacial lake Scuppernock, and that makes perfect sense to us because it's a little bit farther back from the ice margin, so the ice had to pull back a little farther for, uh, for glacial lake Scuppernock to, to form. And then I, I just want to tell you what the, the text put up in the top left of the, of the image. From all the work that I've been doing in all those other lakes out beyond the ice margin, this fits in really well timeless. So uh, our dating from all these lakes indicate that ice started to retreat from the Johnstown position at about 18,500. So that fits in really nicely. Um, you know, we love to see data from different sources um, match up. And that's what we're getting from, from the work we did in these lakes out beyond the ice margin versus this work on Glacial Lake Yamara and also Glacial Lake Scuppernong. So ice continues to retreat, that would put it at the, the Lake Mills Moraine position, retreats some more, you keep exposing more and more of this glacial lake Stepperman, and then the drainage of these lakes is controlled by erosion down on the Rock River, the silver form that kept, kept these two lakes in. Um, and so 11,200 is what I showed you from our course in the Yahara area. And over in Glacial Lake Scuppernong, because it was this big sprawling lake over the flat uh, landscape of, of uh, Jefferson and Dodge and in, into Waukesha County, it was a little bit more complicated. So there were probably some small basins that existed as late as 9,100 years ago. And by about 6,800 years ago, uh, that area over there had transitioned uh, entirely to the wetlands and the marshes that existed all the way up to uh, European occupation of the landscape and the tiling that drained it down, drained all those marshes down into agricultural lands. And so with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. I'd like to acknowledge some of the people who gave us uh, access to some of these marsh plants, uh, and I'd be happy to take some questions for a while. Round of applause for Dr. Kelsey. We're good scientists using meters. Yeah, well, I can. You got it right. 
Yeah, just two questions. Uh, one is, uh, what is the vertical difference between the kind of drop from a glacial lake to the four lakes? How much vertical uh, drop can we see? Um, the other question I have is more, what caused the stop of a glaciated area in the unglaciated areas of Southwest Wisconsin? What was it that caused that to stop there? Sure. Uh, so the, the difference in elevation was actually really modest, uh, probably on the order of just maybe three or at most four meters. So nine, 10, 12 feet of difference. Is that is actually a little bit tough for us to tell uh, because when a lake exists on the landscape, the longer it's on the landscape, the longer it's stable. Uh, you build up beach deposits, you build up beach ridges and the like, uh, which are great indicators for us of um, where the lake level was. Yahara, because it was pretty confined on the landscape, um, confined down in the old Yahara River Valley, it didn't preserve or didn't probably didn't form very many really nice uh, lake uh, shoreline features. And then that's a, exacerbated by the fact that we came along and we built Milton and Madison and Winona right on top of it. So there's really, there's actually really few places where we can actually find nice beaches uh, from Glacier Lake Yahara. You know, I know there's one, um, there's one right next to Edgewood College and Vilas Park down in the woods. There's one uh, over just north of the Beltline where it cuts across uh, Mud Lake. Uh, there's one. You know, if, you're, if you look off to the north from the belt line there, you've got, you know, you're on that stretch, it's a bridge. There's the open water, there's a marshland just to the west of it, and off to the woods behind it, there's another uh, shoreline in there. But the, the, the total number of this is really limited. Um, but we're, you know, we're talking in the sort of three meters of total elevation difference between it. That was enough with this low line landscape to connect all them up and inundate significant parts of. Of the Madison area under this lake. Uh, as far as why the Griffiths area exists, um, part of it is luck. So there were multiple glaciations. The Griffiths area was never surrounded by ice all at one time. It was bordered on different sides by different glaciers. And every time there was a glacier cycle, uh, the glacier had a different geometry. And so if we look at the western boundary of the Driftless area, which is very closely coincident with the Mississippi River today, that was from the, some of the oldest glaciations. So that was ice flowing to the southeast out of the Dakotas and the Canadian Prairie provinces. And as a glacier flows to the south, um, it goes as long as it can until down at that southern margin, it gets so warm that it's melting as fast as, it's, as ice is being delivered. And so it just so happens that the climate was enough to get ice from the Prairie provinces down to pretty much where the Mississippi River is today. But no farther, couldn't run out first. The younger glaciations, we're actually looking at ice coming from, uh, from the Northeast, from the Hudson Bay Lowlands. And the big thing that preserved the uh, driftless area is the Lake Superior Lowland. So the Superior Rifts, of Lake Superior is a tremendously deep feature. It's 1,500 feet deep at its deepest. Um, and ice can flow uphill. Because ice doesn't flow by gravity, it flows by the pressure of ice behind it. And so in places like the Green Bay Lowland and the Lake Michigan Lowland, the depressions are fairly shallow and they're oriented in the direction the ice was flowing. And so the ice was able to flow up out of the Green Bay Lowland and out of Lake Michigan Lowland pretty easily. But in the case of Lake Superior, Lake Superior is oriented perpendicular to the direction the ice was flowing. And it's a huge deep hole. So it took a lot of glaciological effort for the ice to flow out of it, and it just wasn't able to flow very far south. And so it flowed down to uh, like past our northern Wisconsin geography, it flowed down to Anago, it flowed down to Eau Claire, it flowed down uh, just north of Marshfield, but it couldn't get any farther just because of the topographic impediment of, of Lake Superior. Fascinating. Anna has a virtual question for us. We have one here from Mark Riedel, who is from PNR, and he's also on our board. Mark is curious, how deep down were you able to go in the Nine Springs watershed? And Mark has another, I'm just going to ask them both at the same time, they're different questions. He also wanted to know, given the historic patterns of lake levels and sediment types, how might we compare current lake levels elevated by dams 
uh, to natural pre-European settlement lake levels, could this have any lasting effect on our current water quality? That's a big question. Uh, okay. The first one is an easy one because I because I know that one. <laughs> um, that 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 location was one of the ones where we got out to our maximum uh, depth that we went, which was about fifty feet for you anglophiles. Um, that was one of the locations that we didn't get down into the pre-late sediment, and and in in all of these sort of fifty feet is. Uh, where we gave up just because it gets more difficult and the quality of sediment that we uh, are able to recover declines pretty rapidly beyond that depth. Uh, as far as the uh, change in lake levels from, from pre-Euro uh, occupation of the landscape to now, you know, obviously, yes, the, the lakes are all, are all elevated. This, you know, for us, it, it, it made a uh, situation where we were it narrowed down the window of places that we could look uh, for these sediments because there there would have been other places that would have been ideal that would have been exposed on a pre-European occupation landscape uh, that are just like or maybe even better the place than the places that we cored. Um, as far as the water quality, I think that's uh, getting out into a realm of things that I wouldn't just be walking out onto a branch; I may be falling right off of it. Started talking water quality. All right, moving on. I saw a couple other hands pop up here. One over here. How deep was the ice over Madison? How deep was the ice over Madison? Uh, when it was at its peak uh, out of the Johnstown Moraine, you know, you might easily, easily be talking a thousand feet of ice here. You know, the, the, slope, the slope of the ice, you know, if, if you go back historically, and look at some of these diagrams, they kind of show a cliff of ice coming right up to the margin. And that's not the way it was. It, it's actually a really shallow slope. Uh, if any of you have gone vacationing in places where there's glaciers, Alaska or, or Iceland, you know, the, the margin of glaciers you see in those places uh, is actually very similar to the margin here. It's a very shallow slope. But over a couple couple miles, even that shallow slope would probably add up to something on the order of a thousand feet that here. At the, at the Capitol building. One quick question for me, actually. You were mentioning the receding of the glaciers and the back and forth motion based on the seasons, I'm assuming. What was the difference in time between having the singular Yahara Lake to the modern formation we see now? So it was all in all probably around 7,000 years that that Lake Yahara would have existed on the landscape. So it was just before 18,000 years ago that the landscape was exposed. And it was it was kept at that level by what we call a sill, a, a, a layer of bedrock down on the Rock River. But as long as that sill was in place, the lake was gonna be maintained. But of course, over time, rivers love to erode things. And so it was by about 11,200, 7,000 years later that that sill Eroded down and drained glacial um, lake Yahara down to its modern level. So, 7,000 years is a length of time to us geologists, but pretty healthy for the existence of a lake. Hey, James has a question now. So, you sometimes are talking about in, in years and thousands, and then sometimes you get to years of like 200, right? And so, what is the science behind where sometimes you can get down into the hundreds, or you would need to round up to the five hundreds or the thousands, and what 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 information do you need to make those more secure? Yeah, yeah. So, so having having that kind of control, the precision and the error on ages um, relates to the to the methodologies that we use. So in, in in the in the course of time that that I've worked at the geological survey. Um, we, when, when I started, I came and we started looking at these lakes. We were using a dating methodology, which is really esoteric, and I'm not going to try to even explain the ins and outs of science of it, but it's, it's a dating method called optically stimulated luminescence. And basically what it tells you is how long a particular grain of sand has been buried and has not been exposed to ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Um, it's a really cool methodology. The problem with it is the errors on it are huge. So very often the errors are on the range of 10%. So if we get an age of 20,000 years old, 
that would be 20,000 plus or minus 2,000 years old. And one of the reasons that we use that dating methodology originally is because over 50 years of uh, geologists working on this landscape, finding uh, preserved plant material from back in that window of time uh, was something that geologists had never found. They had, they had simply felt that the climate was probably too cold to allow for too much in the way of plants to grow, which prevented us from using radiocarbon dating, which is a much more precise dating method. Um, as I came to the survey and as I started doing pouring into all of these lake basins, that's when we started finding all these layers of little terrestrial plants, plants that were living on the edge of these uh, lakes as they existed. So even if even if the if, if you're right at the peak of the glaciation and the lake is dammed by the ice, you get a mile away and the climate's just warm enough that you can get these little sedges and salix and the like growing on the, the edge of the lake and it would wash in. Uh, and so we immediately switched to radiocarbon because the, the relatively speaking, the error on radiocarbon dating is minuscule. You know, I said for this OSL, this optically stimulated luminescence, you might have 20,000 plus or minus 2,000. A similar radiocarbon age would come back with uh, 20,000 plus or minus 50. And so it puts us in a range where we can, you know, I, I'm actually using a, a conceit of time and space to consolidate those ages down to just a 11,200. You know, but those were really talking sort of a 200 year window and that's because of this, the modern radiocarbon age that we can do with it because of the work that I've been doing in these lakes that finding, finding out that that material is actually pretty ubiquitous on the landscape in these, in these lake deposits that, that I've been working in. Couple more questions and then we'll wrap it up for today. Are there any moraines in Maine County or in Madison area? So there is the there is the Johnstown moraine, which is um, it, it, it's kind of a kind of a conundrum for the because the for the ice being in that position at at uh, for several thousands of years, it's it's really not uh, spectacular topographically. So if you go. So we're going to test your local geography again. Like if you if you go uh, to the west on Menlo Point Road, as you go out, you get to Shoveler Sink. At the very last rise, as you're driving west before you get to Shoveler Sink, uh, you cross the Johnstown Moraine. There, um, you can see it. You can see the Johnstown Moraine. Uh, this is getting up into Sauk County, but you can see it. Um, uh, just north of, of Sauk City. You might not realize it, but if you're driving up on, and I can't remember remember my highway, well, it's 12 or 14. Uh, if you're driving the highway up there towards Baraboo, you look off to the east, flat surface where the former Bad Garvey and Anderson plant was, and then a very low ridge that's got trees on it. That's the Dot Sound Uh You see it, it the, the two places very large are where you come into Devil's Lake from either end. Um, where literally on the north end, you go over the moraine and there's that big drop down to the entrance. Um, and then if you come in from the south, there's also a pretty big rise. Both of those are variations of the downtown moraine. All right, uh, two more questions. Let's see if we can squeeze them in real quick. Uh, yeah, the Lake Mendota is the most studied lake in the world. And I was wondering, how is that determined like by hours or different types uh, of stuff? <laughs> uh, let's see, that was probably derived from an academic. So I would bet that what they probably did was do a uh, literature search as far as the number of peer reviewed publications about research on the lake, both in limnology and sedimentology and, and climatology. From the limnologists that are here on town, here in town, and the glacial geology people. You know, there has been an awful lot of work that's been done, but the claiming that it's the most studied lake is, you know, going to the superlative swing. Maybe we don't need that. Does the Ice Age Trail pretty accurately follow the edge of the last, last glacier? Yes. Yeah. So the, 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 the whole idea of the, the Ice Age Trail that cuts across the state is that there's 
uh, two features that it tracks. So it tracks the edge of the last glaciation, and it does that from uh, down here in the Cross Plains area all the way up to Anago and then across through Eau Claire over the um, Minnesota state line. And the other feature it tracks is what's called the Kettle Moraine, um, which is called Moraine, but it's not actually a Moraine. Um, what the Kettle Moraine is, is the point where the Green Bay lobe and the Lake Michigan lobe met. And so the two, that those two lobes of this huge ice sheet where they were flowing next to each other, we're depositing all sorts of sediment, and that, that's what makes the topography that we call the cattle moraine. And so that, that extends uh, from, from down in, uh, I think, Waukesha County is as far south as it goes, and it, and it extends all the way up into Door County, uh, the NSH Trail does. And so it's following not the ice margin, but the margin of those two lobes together. But otherwise, yeah, that's exactly, exactly the point of where it's located. Do we have time? Squeeze them in? No. We're getting the shrug. We're getting the shrug and the. Uh, the oh, but maybe go ahead. Yeah. Maybe go ahead. Uh, so, to clarify, 11 to 18,000 years ago, all the sediment is, is landing in most of Dane County, except for the Driftless area. So, we've got about 50, uh, roughly 30, 50 feet of sediment below us that ages from when the glacier is pulling back. Yes, is it even deeper east of here where those where the glaciers were deeper? The short answer is yes. Okay, so so we're looking at a, a a lake system. So you know you've got this newly exposed landscape as the glacier retreated. There's not a lot of vegetation on it. Um, conditions were quite harsh. They're they're what we call permafrost. So the ground was permanently frozen for thousands of years after the glacier retreated. And so there was a lot of sediment that was naturally eroding and being sucked down into um, Glacial Lake Yahara. So that the rates of sediment accumulation we see in Glacial Lake Yahara are much faster than what you'd see in, in the four lakes today. Um, as far as the actual depth and thickness, if you get over into Jefferson and Dodge County into, um, into Glacial Lake Scuppernong, it is much deeper. Um, just I'm going to say tail end of May or maybe start of June. Um, we put in a core into Glacial Lake Scuppernong that we can only go about 50 feet down with that coring method that I showed. It's called geoprobe coring. If we want to go deeper, we have to go to a, a larger drilling mechanism we call rotosonic. And rather than just that one little track mountain unit you see there in this photograph, uh, rotosonic coring is done with two 60 foot three axle trucks that may tail to tail and it's put up a boom tower. Um, but in, in the best situation, we can go down over 400 feet with uh, rotosonic coring and back in late May or early June, uh, we put in a core in Glacial Lake Scotland that I think was right around 300 feet down the, down the bedrock. So, yeah. Uh, just by some Madison here at Black Earth Creek, is there evidence that you, know, you mentioned the Middleton Airport? Is there any evidence is it just the elevation of the bedrock that kept that from flowing, draining west down those channels? Yeah, yeah. So the the the, the bedrock is very close to the to the surface there. You know, of course, there's a couple places around where you can see quarries. When Glacial Lake Middleton existed, it actually did drain down Black Earth Creek. But there was a bedrock sill that kept it up at a lake level. Um, once in it, so it was trapped by the bedrock on the west and the actual margin of the glacier on the east. And as the glacier retreated back to the east, then there was an easier lower path that it carved with a little gorge at Pheasant Branch. All right, one more round of applause for you know, I know the questions are kind of coming in a slot first, and they look picked up. So, if you have additional questions, we'll be able to get those to Dr. Carson by emailing Clean Lakes Alliance. That's info at cleanlakesalliance.org, and we'll work to get that answer. But again, it's great talk. Again, I think we love the lakes. We know as much as we think we know about them, but I think we really uh, double or triple our knowledge today. So, really appreciate the conversation. Um, be sure to join us uh, next month at the Edgewater or online for our Clean Lakes 101 topic, which will be 
healthy lakes, healthy climate, of course, important. And presenting on that topic will be uh, Dane County Executive Joe Police. So he will actually be in the house discussing that. That will take place on September 13th. And you can find more details at cleanlakeslights.org. Before everyone goes, I wanted to take a quick selfie with everyone. So we, can we think we can have a nice big smile back here and squeeze everyone in? Let's see if we can do it. Here. <laughs> One, one, two, three. And we'll call it good enough. Thanks, everyone, for coming in, and we'll see you for uh, Wednesday in September. <laughs>